Okay, so here we are, lesson two about skies. Um, I'm going to start with a screen share of the image that I sent you guys. Um, and the reason being, I just kind of want to share with you part of the process that I do when I start to look at images. Um, because, you know, it's really easy to just jump into a painting and not really think about it. And Michelle was talking about last week, um, she mentioned getting lost in, in your painting. And that happens so easily. So we're going to talk about just some thought processes um, on how to manipulate the image and see what you want to see out of it. And then we're going to start our exercise with just doing some thumbnail sketches and compositional sketches and talking about how to break things out and keep ourselves on track and have a little reference to go back and forth to while you're painting. So let's, let me get my image up here. All right. So my printer didn't, it's not the best. And, you know, it's, it's pretty good if I tell it to be on its, you know, tippy top printing game, you know, the, the extra special print, but I'm not going to waste all that ink on a reference photo that I'm just using. So this is a sunset, obviously in Ventnor. Um, I think it was kind of cool outside. I don't think it was quite summer. Oh, I know when this was. This was last December because it was right before the holiday parade where Sam was marching in the Ventnor holiday parade. So I was sneaking over to the beach to take pictures before we lined up for the parade. So um, if I go into my edit, now I have nothing fancy for editing purposes. Um, I just have what came with the computer. It's an HP computer, nothing crazy. Um, but I just wanted to show you things to think about. So when you have this foreground that's really dark and it's the sand. Um, you can mess with things. A, maybe just so you can see what's going on. Sometimes I do that a lot where I'll have one image kind of blown out so I can see what's happening. Um, and then I'll print as it normally is and then I'll print a really blown out one. So now you can see the sand but the sky is a hot mess, you know what I mean? So you know, that just messing, you know, just messing with the brightness a little bit. Um, exposure kind of does the same, same thing. But when we have, over the summer, I did a portrait class up at Ocean County and I had this really kind of cool picture of Gabby I wanted to use and she was in direct profile but her nose she was outside and her nose was the same exact value as the bushes behind her so if you didn't know Gabby it was really hard to get the shape of her nose so you can go in and sharpen things up with contrast you know you can go either way just to sharpen up some lines so you can see a little bit um highlights and shadows and well vignettes and stuff. But the other thing that I was playing with this morning before I printed um, was all these lovely filters. You know, we, we know, we, you know, the kids have them for, these are much more simple than anything you have on Instagram or anything like that, but kind of fun stuff to pull color out. Like that sand is kind of gray and things like that. It's not that great here. You know, you, I put it on vivid cool. Well, now my sand is blue, which is kind of neat. Um, but when sand is too blue all over, then it just looks like a pile of snow. Um, so those are things to consider, but it changed the sky completely. So this is one of those times again, where I would have two versions printed the original and then something that I push the color just to remind me of, you know, what I can do. Um, and then there's, it, it can kind of change here. It gives it a little more lavender kind of a feel, but it still changed the sky a little bit. Um, 
but when it changes the sky on this one, you can see the actual sun a little bit and the clouds that are around it versus the original where that whole area is kind of blown into one little bit there. Um, but I kind of like it blown into one. So in terms of color, that's what this, this whole thing is about right now, showing you this. This is all about color and how I'm going to punch it up and play with it. So um, I think I said last week, I do love the color combo of purple and green together. So even though these dune grasses are probably in their dead yellowy okra kind of color, uh, I'm not, I might push them into a little bit of green up against a little bit of lavender in the sand. Um, there's not a lot of big shadow shapes in the sand, but there are some shadow shapes. So we'll talk about that in a minute. That's a place that you can get lost. Um, another thing, if we go back to the adjustment, so you can see the buildings, if you want the buildings in your piece, if you brighten it up a little bit, you can see this I don't know if that's a single family home or a condo. I mean, this is obviously a condo building here, but um, how much information you wanna put for the buildings. Uh, I'm probably gonna keep it pretty simple. These are people walking on the beach. And then there's, I guess this is the Margate fishing pier because the Ventnor fishing pier would have been behind me. So. That's something you can completely leave out and that's up to you. I might leave that out just because it's gonna be so small in the overall feel of things. Um, I'm not gonna save anything on that. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does that make sense? Where we're just kind of playing, just kind of play with color, play with what's there. I didn't mess with cropping um, because this is how I printed it, but this is where I would, this is where I would start to test the composition. And when you do that, and a lot of the Apple products also have the grid that you can just put on top. Um, this is really helpful for trying to find, if you're trying to work on um, the golden mean where everything is, you know, you're you have it div divided into three um, either going horizontally or vertically. Once that grid's on there, you can see if you fall into that or if you need to crop some or move things around. And then wherever there's a cross, wherever these markings meet is always a good place to have a focal point. So if I... Do that. Now that the sun's the focal point, and that is technically a good composition based on the basics of the golden mean. Okay. You can move it up here, and the sun is still basically in that crosshair, and that's the same effect. So you could do more sky, you could do more sand. Um, you can make this building your point of interest, which would Every Renee, every time you crop, you get the grid. I don't remember even noticing that on mine. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah. So I don't know if that's just an HP thing or if a Windows thing, um, but I'm also holding my finger on the mouse pad to keep the oh, okay. grid up because if I let go, it goes away. Oh, it goes away. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just holding it just so you guys can see it. But that's what I do, you know, just kind of moving it around, checking focal points. Um, it's easier to do that electronically than it is on a thumbnail, but we're still gonna do a thumbnail sketch anyway. But I do like to do this for composition kind of a thing. So I'm gonna cancel that. I do not wanna save it. I'm going to stop the share. Okay. Okay, next trick and tip. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about another little trick I use. So this is just a paper protector, just the generic one you get at Staples. A couple of you have already seen this and a dry erase marker. 
this is nice, totally reusable. You don't have to worry about wasting paper. Um, you can keep it. Um, I'm going to switch cameras. Okay. So as you, when I was talking about my printout, it's not that great. Um, it's not that great for the foreground, but it's pretty nice <laughs> for the sky. Um, so I don't have to worry about that too much. Do kind of have to look a little closer to decide how to handle. That's why I, I was showing you how to brighten it up so you could see what is here. If I just handed you this in a classroom setting, we would really have to discuss what this is so you've got grasses but you've also got buildings in the background and how do you interpret that how do you paint that to be what it's supposed to be right so first similar to what we just did i'm just going to do very simply if i outline what's already there I to get a feel of the overall image itself. Now, show you once I get this kind of colored in, I'll move on the white paper. So if I didn't change anything, my big abstract shapes look like this. I've got one very specific line of dark shape, right? And then next in line is the clouds. But what's kind of cool about this particular one is the directional feel that everything has you know you can kind of feel that everything's coming down and going through so this is the simplest form of road mapping this image finding your abstract shapes you can do this with tracing paper we've done that before in class Tracing paper is nice because it kind of blurs everything and you can't really tell what it is. Um, so I'm going to grab a paper towel, maybe. Oh, I know what I got. So if I look at those big abstract shapes and I'm like, meh, I don't know. It's not really speaking to me. Erase that away. And then I can start to play with cropping. Okay, I want to take some of that out. I still have some direction. I still have the sense of my abstract shape. I lose some of the contrast in the sky. And then I can kind of look at that. It's simplifying the overall size. And if we were in class, I might just tell you to fold your paper, fold your paper how you want it to be cropped, right? Um, so this is just a little tool, again, very inexpensive, or you could use tracing paper. So that is just a simple black and white, literally black and white way to roadmap. The final way what we're gonna do now is I have, well, I have this, of course it's backwards on screen. So dual brush pens. Um, 
somebody had recommended they were by Tombo, T-O-M-B-O-W. Somebody had recommended this brand or said that this is what they used. And then I saw one was on sale. So it's a whole range of grays. Um, and I think this is an eraser thing or a blender, which is, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know how to really use that. Um, so I just grab for myself because this gray is actually pretty dark. So black, gray, and the white of the paper. That's really all you need if you, for your thumbnails, um, if you wanna go into, if it's going to be a really big painting that you're planning, you can certainly go into a lot more value distinction than that. Um, so the point of all this, <laughs> Probably like, okay, this is getting old. The point of all this is to work out the overall feel of your painting because this is what's going to grab someone. It's the shape of the composition, those big, bold, abstract shapes and their contrast is what's gonna draw someone in from across the room. Then they can come up to it and enjoy all the details that you put into it. But if from across the room, it doesn't grab their attention, they're not gonna come over to it. So this is where our big abstract shapes can make or break, make a big story for us. So I'm gonna do a couple of different shapes. I'm doing that because I know, I'll do that in a marker. I know I grabbed a piece of square board I knew I wanted to do this composition in a square. So I pulled out a square. Um, I'm just gonna leave that like that for right now. When you're looking, so we just did really simply with the dry erase marker, the concept of, um, just the black and the white, the big abstract shapes. What is super important to work out is value. And to see value, you stand back and squint to blur everything over. Because if I stand back and squint, this is obviously the darkest because of the way it printed. And it's still pretty dark anyway. And then it kind of curves into here. It becomes, it becomes its own little abstract shape. And then if I squint some more, the next value shift is the blue in the sky. And then of course the brightest is in here. So just to represent those, Step that in there. And if I'm squinting, this all kind of comes together in this little C shape here. So this has two ends. So it almost looks like a giant wave crashing. So this doesn't have to be neat. I'm just blocking in values for composition. This helps you sometimes choose colors because when we're looking at what our brain tells us is sand and dune grass and all that stuff, we're looking at colors in a logical manner and these are in shadow. So the logical colors are a little skewed. It's not quite what's there. This.
It's like an inner. So seeing these values in a, their simplest form will help you choose your colors a little bit better. So you know when you're grabbing, if you're thinking about lavender, you're not grabbing a bright sun-filled lavender, you're gonna grab a deeper lavender that's not gonna be so reflective of light. I'm also going to kind of play with some compositioning here. So I want for myself, I want more sky and less sand. <laughs> I know I don't particularly care to paint sand very often. So I don't know that I want all of this sand in here. Now, the fun thing about something like this is this sand in this time of day can be super simplified. You don't have to worry about footprints and, um, all kinds of stuff like that. It can just be super simplified and represented in just a block of color. So you can play with that kind of experimentation there. So I'm basically just gonna do that same thing here. I'm cutting off some of that building. I don't really have, because I'm cutting this off, I don't really have all of that extra dark over there. So I can fill this in. I have that angle going for the dune. I can push that darkness a little bit if I want to once I get going. And then I do have all of that in there. You know, I have a little bit of that. So I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes. I'm gonna pause the recording. So go ahead and finalize what you want your composition to be. Um, and we'll pick back up with our line drawing on the image. Does anybody have questions though before we do that? Um, are we gonna do, are we gonna go straight into the big painting or are we gonna do like a small value thing first or is this the small value thing? Well, this is the small value thing. If you okay. want to do the value in color, we can certainly do that on our. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just curious so, so that I know what the next thing to set up is. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is, this is our lesson for this morning. So. Got it. We'll go from there. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. We'll pause that. All right. So like I said, this is a 12 by 12. Um, and I'm going to start it off and as simply as I can and big, bold shapes. You guys can't see any of that. All right, so like in big, bold shapes to kind of mimic the overall feel of the value drawings that we did. Um, a lot of times when I come into a painting, I already have an idea of how I think I want it to be finished, like whether I want it to be detailed or simplified. Um, I feel like I want this one to be a little bit simplified, especially in the foreground. However, I also know myself that you just gotta let the painting do what the painting needs to do sometimes. So my goal is to have super simple shapes and markings uh, in the foreground because the foreground is not the star of the show. The, the sky is the star of the show. So I want to keep this as nice and simple as I can. I want it to represent the dune, um, but I don't want to get overly caught up 
in all the little dune grasses and all the little markings because we're here all about the sky because there's a lot of stuff going on in the sky lots and lots of nuances um lots of really soft transition points in those clouds so i don't want to go too crazy with that with the bottom so but what is super important are angles the angle of the dune is really going to give you that feel if you get these angles correct you'll get that feel that it is a bit of a hill and you have that heft to it so i have to make sure that those lines are correct before anything else so which is kind of nice because when you hold the skewer there it pretty much goes all the way up through generically all the way up through those buildings <laughs> Course, there's little bits of curves and such on the way um if i'm looking at the concept of the golden mean we're talking about composition if i divide this into thirds i'm gonna have the bottom two thirds be the foreground sand and the top two thirds is going to be sky so if i'm looking at this side put my marker away if i'm looking at this side technically it's going to go closer to that so this side's going to be a little bit off both sides don't have to evenly be the thirds to still work with that rule i left this unfolded here because there's some fun detail that i could still possibly work in there So I know some of this is straight because it's the water, this little sliver of yellow. And here is the water, this little tiny triangle. And then there's this triangle. So now I'm really breaking out into basic shapes. These are the things, so I'm getting that angle flat carefully picking up and transferring just the angle. I'm kind of eyeballing measurements. I'm not too concerned about measurements much in a lot of landscapes. And I keep, I must move that a lot. So let me do that again. Yeah, I kind of made it go up too far, which is fine. Oh, my skewers a little bit too. That doesn't <laughs> help. <laughs> I like me, just a little crooked, a little off. I'll clean up these lines in just a second so you can see better what's going on. See, I also have to be super careful because I can get, there is something wonderfully natural and fluid about just going into the painting and start painting what you feel and just go without a plan. I do really love to do that sometimes, just kind of go in with a mental plan and just kind of see what happens. And I do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> because I just like to but when I do stuff like this sometimes I kind of get into my own head with a little bit of overcomplicating because I was trying to think about it too much so it's just one of the things I just have to think about I don't want these buildings to be super huge either um I don't know how the building ends. So if I put it in there, I'm going to have to let it fall off the edge because I had to move things. If I really wanted to, I could go through and kind of measure how big everything is. Um, but I just want to get 
an idea. So if I'm looking for size, a little bit of size comparison, I can put my skewer across the top of this building and it lines up with the bulk of that building. It just is straight across. So that kind of gives you um, the much better example than doing it by eyeball because I was making the building too large in comparison. But this gives you a better scale when you can find something that, see now my brain's stopping. I told you I'm in a fog today. <laughs> so it keeps the perspective nice. It keeps it so this suddenly doesn't become a hundred story building versus a 20 story building, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. There's a little bit of a, okay. So let me clean up some of this in here. So this is the water. Certainly don't need all that graphite in there when I'm going to be putting that light reflective yellow in there. I'm going to tighten, I'm going to, that line got a little wonky. If I choose to put the pier in there, the fishing pier, I can do that at the very end with my pencil. I don't need to what have the heck fishing pier. I don't even see it. It's so tiny. It's it follows the horizon of the water. So if you find that little sliver of pale yellowish right up against the sand. That's water, and right above it is the fishing gear. Okay. Again, you know, it's, I certainly, to keep everything nice and simple, it's not necessary, but, and this line right here is more of a, this line here is just an indication of plain sand and dune filled sand. Um, There's like a secondary value shift because the grasses kind of fill up in here and then they become a little more sparse. So I'm just giving little indications of how the sand is moving. These aren't necessarily lines that I'm going to need and use, but um, in terms of color, but this this helps me when I start to make my marks, if I'm going to make simple, simple marks, I need to have the directions laid out for me. So these are nice and matchy. And again, I'm just using my skewer. So over here, you can just kind of see that little bit of motion just to get you uphill. And you want to make sure you're not going too high uphill. You don't want the sand coming up at you. So if you get that angle right, it'll work nicely. And I'm just looking at the little shadow shapes to get those angles. And then up here, it's a little bit of a softer angle. And we'll have a nice blur of grass in there. All right, so onto the sky. In terms of drawing, there's not a lot to draw for me. Um, when I think about drawing clouds, I just need to make sure, um, I just heard my email go off and I was just making sure it wasn't you guys. I get the weirdest email. I swear to God. <laughs> um, oh, I don't want to do that. Okay. Um, I have a very simple rule of thumb. If you can see through the cloud, don't draw it. Meaning if you can see little bits of blue and things like that, don't you don't need to draw it. If you can, if it's its own mass, then you can draw it in. So um, <laughs> that's a squirrel. He found a squirrel outside chasing it up a tree. Um, so the clouds, you know, when we do like big stormy clouds, they're going to be big, heavy and hefty kind of clouds. 
here, um, it's like a cloud front, but everything is super soft. So I'm gonna mark in some of the darker, just to remind myself, you know, this is gonna be that nice little purple. I'm not marking anything around the yellow because I don't want graphite mixing with the yellow. I don't wanna fight that. I do though love these angles. So same thing with the dune grass. I want to make sure I represent um, the angles properly of how the clouds are going to go. Um, I was once told never end an item into the corner of a painting. I don't know why, um, if there's something distracting about that. So I usually kind of try to move it just a little bit but it's clouds, so it's our own little, nobody can tell us we were wrong moment. So I'll leave that in there. So we have some nice motion happening and then we'll have those oranges that come down. I'm gonna pause for a minute, finish up your line drawing. And then while we're paused, if you don't have any pipe insulation out or something to blend with, go ahead and get it. I have my pipe insulation cut here. So um, I'm going to do a dry underpainting um, because I want to paint a little bit more directly. So I will get some color stained into the sky, but the grass, I might just paint directly, meaning picking very specific colors and just making very bold marks. I can always change my mind if it's not working out like I want it to. So keep that in mind. Never, never worry about trying something new. But <coughs> this is pastel. We can always change it. It's not permanent. So I'm going to pause for a minute. Because you have a broken foot in your <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. Back at it. Here we go. So I think what I'm going to do, we have in the past talked about how yellow <laughs> is a little persnickety and it kind of needs its own space, right? Um, and we do have kind of a bright spot of yellow. So I'm going to start there only for the sake of, I want to make sure I have enough yellow and bright, a little more than necessary from that spot that radiates out. Um, I can always calm it down with the oranges and stuff around it and, and work its way back in, but I'd rather have a big space of a little too much yellow because a little too much yellow is better than trying to shove yellow back in there. Um, so technically, if you want, there is that white hot piece of sun like we had last week. And then that white hot piece of sun kind of radiates this golden reddish orange right into the, the horizon line there. So that can be something a little later. It's also something that you just have to make a decision as to what you want. This is something that happens in the camera. Is this something that happens in real life? Maybe, maybe not. Chances are you're not staring at the sun long enough to find out, right? <laughs> so it kind of hurts when you stare at the sun like that. So it's all up for interpretation. So let me grab some, my bright yellows and some of that. This has got a tint of yellow in it, but it's in the white family. It's closer to white. So I'm just gonna mark a pretty large swath here because like I said I just want it to be a little bigger I'd rather be too big and, and pull it back in and then a nice it is a lemony yellow we kind of talk about you know the properties of the yellow whether it's lemony or creamy or orangey this is pretty lemony 
which really is persnickety with its placement. <coughs> so again, a little extra. There's a little bit in here too. So this one has some like nice striations that go the whole opposite way that match and mimic the sand. I'm just going to kind of get that in there. And I'll be using that to blend in the softness of those um, nice salmony peachy pinks later. That's all nice and blocked in there. I'm happy with that. I needed that in there. That space is safe. And now I think I'm going to work from the top down, um, especially with the sky. I want to get in these blocks of color. So thinking about perspective here for another second. So I'm standing in front of the dune. I have a pretty large spanse of sky. And because I also, for compositional reasons, I added a little more sky because I'm working on a larger sheet of paper. The gradation, how it gets, the further away the sun is, the deeper the blue gets up high. If you push that blue deep, too far down and close to the yellow, it becomes a little wrong. So you really have to just step back and squint to see how bright the blue is in the sky still before it gets to that darkness. Um, when the sun is already set, that deep blue keeps coming down. And that's gorgeous. I love those colors. But if the sun is present or almost still present, then you have to have enough of that light. So you have to judge based on your paper how much of the dark blue you can have or the darker blue. Because it's still not dark, dark, but it's a little bit, little bit dark. And the blues change, right? This is a December sky. Like right now, October, November, blue skies are so intense, intensely blue. Um, but these are a little more subdued. So this has a little bit of like a gray in its blue. I use this in oceans a lot. Um, I'm being a little gentle because I'm going to be blending and adding some to it, some other blues. Leave that aside so you can see a lot of two, which is fine. So this is about the same value, but it's a different, it's more of a cerulean, maybe not cerulean, it's just a different property of blue. It plays nicely with it. So this is the perfect example of same value. If you look away, it's you can't really tell much of a difference between the two colors that I use there. But if you open your eyes, you can see this one's a little grayer, a little duller, <laughs> and this one's a little brighter. So this is the perfect uh, example for value shift. So now we have Some of that blue green. Oh, that's too dark. You can also keep your scrap paper handy. I'm just testing right on the paper, you know, because why not? <laughs> this is still more in the blue than the green family, but it's going to be useful. It's adding a little bit of a darker turquoise in there, just so I can have some of that greenish to blend with later. Okay. 
And so, you know, remember too, yellow and blue make green. And it this is super important for the sky too. I mean, so in here, when we're looking at the picture, it has that little bit of green cast. It's because there's a little bit of cloud front or a little bit of something that's reflecting the yellow right on top of that blue sky, which is giving us that little bit of green. Um, so you can certainly use your pastel colors to do that work for you. <clears throat> I'm gonna get some of these purples kind of kicking in there. Um, a lot of times, you know, when we look at the colors of these deep reflective clouds, you know, it can look too purple or it can look too blue or it can look too gray. Um, I do find that I like a combination of blue and purple together to get that color that I want because usually by themselves, those colors are a little too flat, but mixing them together is a nice combo. So this is just straight up a Rembrandt purple. Putting it in there. I'm going to put it down here too. And it flares off into that red, which is fun. Um, this little lighter meaning airier purplish cloud, that's gonna sit on top. So I'm not gonna focus on that yet. Anything that looks like it's overall sitting on top, like how these little light clouds are kind of puffing their way up in here, I'm gonna let them be. When there's a full shift of color, that's what I'm gonna focus on right now. So I'm gonna get into some of those rosy reds into the oranges as the base layer. Again, just laying the color down. And the colors at this stage, I always find look a little wonky and I don't like them. It just, the sunset skies take those layers. It just takes a little bit of time to get what you need and what you want. Extra in there. Oh, that's the same color. Yeah. Thought I was getting into some good orange and it was the same as what I just had. Some of these colors are the same ones that I had out from last week. So when we used all those reddish oranges in there, they're coming in handy again. For this type of a situation, when the buildings don't need a lot of detail, I always find that it's best to fill in the information that's going to require the most work. And for this situation, the sky at this section is going to require the most work. And it will be simpler to carve in the buildings after the fact than before. This little dark cloud that's hanging up over here. I'm not worried about that just yet. I think, sorry, my back just tweaked. <laughs> um, 
this is one of those things that I can add on top if I choose to after the fact. What's really going to be fun is these windows here. You can see the sky reflecting on the windows in the front of that building there. And that's going to be a nice little touch when we get there. Um, so let me see. It's a little too blue. I'm going to keep going lighter in my blue here. So I don't want it to be too pale because there is quite a richness at this hour. Um, I need to lighten it up from there. It's still a little dark. And you feel like you're picking up such a light colored blue and then it's, there we go. So then this blue, the nice light blue. And then when I start to layer those yellows on top, I'm really going to get those subtle changes in that green feel. But I need that blue down first. I'm going to fill some more of that in. I can change that later. OK. So this is what it's going to look like before I start blending. Really kind of crazy, right? I think it looks good. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, if I, I still have a little bit of, well, the value shift is a little bit off, but like this is the correct value up top and down below. These oranges and yellows are reading, um, well, I guess it is kind of, it is correct on the value scale. It should be, if I squint, oh yeah, it is right. My brain was getting in the way because if I squint, it is correct. So we've got the dark and the dark and then the medium and then the bright in here. So if I squint, it is how it reads, but the yellow itself is so bright, it feels like it's uh, throwing off the value scale, but it's really kind of not. <clears throat> I'm going to stick a little bit of that pink up here for playing purposes later. Um, if you notice, you know, these colors are certainly not exact to the photograph. I'm not worried about a, getting an exact match. As you guys know, the, my phone took this picture. So between my phone to my computer, to my printer, everything's just going to be a little bit different. Um, and the light reflects differently by the second in sunrises and sunsets. And we know that. So I'm just gonna play with the basic colors until I get the feeling that I want. All right, is, how's everybody doing? I know we're moving a little bit slower today. I took a little extra time on the, uh, on the beginning stages, but we're really gonna focus on the sky for the rest of the time. It's already 10, 15. So if you need a break, please take a break get your water, make sure your water and stretching things out. Like I'm trying to stretch my back as we're talking here. All right. I am going to start with my pipe insulation. I'm, and this is basically most of this. I'm not really blending, blending just yet. I'm more setting it in place. I'm kind of staining the paper, if you will. Um, just moving the pigment around, super thin layer. I just want it all nice and set. And then I can start gently adding more layers. Um, this is going to take, especially because it's 12 by 12, it's going to take multiple pieces. Um, so I don't start pulling things off. And because I went super thin, meaning super light and touch, and you can see the paper through, it's gonna tear these pieces up really quickly, um, but that's okay. Much cheaper than 
new pastel. Uh, I do apologize. It's going to be extra scratchy sounding because there is so little pastel. Um, make sure that if you have a color shift, don't go from a blue into your yellow. Make sure you get a clean piece in between. When you start to see little bits of, when you start to see little crumblies, throw your piece away. That means it's eaten up and that means it'll just start taking that pigment off. So I've already used one to just do that little area. Holding it a little too lately. And again, I am just being super light. I just want to kind of move it around so I don't really see much tooth, but there's a nice thin layer of color. When I get into this orange, it was a Jack Richardson, so it has a lot of pigment down in comparison to the other pieces. Already on to piece number three. Um, you might be asking, why aren't we using rubbing alcohol for this? Um, <clears throat> my reasoning is there's so much happening, um, to do the rubbing alcohol. And trying to keep everything in its place for the feel that I want. I think it would be too difficult to keep everything where it's supposed to be, but it could be a really fun experiment for a different time. <laughs> you know, you get some kind of trippy, trippy little drippings and, you know, fun feel. I thought I heard my email go off. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right, so on to purples. When I'm into the cloud here, I'm just kind of making, oh, a mosquito followed him in. If you see me suddenly flailing, it's because I'm trying to kill a mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That one died kind of fast there. Um, I still like the directional markings. So up here, I use kind of a scumbly motion for that cloud. And down here, they're a little bit smoother. Now I can go a little bit of that red into the orange, but when I get to the yellow, I need to change. And I can pull even some of that orange up into the blue as a part of that next layering and softening those edges. I'm not too worried about my lines of the horizon right now because I know I can tighten them up after. All right, yellow, yellow. Much more gentle setting it in place in the yellow. Okay. I'm gonna pause it for just a minute, let you guys get to pretty much this point if you haven't already. Okay. So the next half hour, at least, <laughs> I'm gonna be just really, I'm layering in the next color. So these are all a little bit darker, a little bit crazier. Um, and so I'm now I'm gonna bring in that softness and all those other kind of colors and layers. Um, thinking about colors that I'm gonna be choosing. 
there is that nice yellow reflection that's sitting on top. You know, we always, we talk about working from back to front, working from what sits the furthest away to what comes toward us. And if we're looking at these clouds, it's still the same holds true. The blue of the sky is the furthest away and everything else sits on top. So, and how we get to what sits on top is going to take a little patience. So this little yellow streak, there's like yellow in the middle that comes through here. And then around it is some of the orange. That yellow is the, that sits on top. That's what the sun is directly reflecting on is the cloud that's closest to the ground. So I still need to get more orange in there before I can even consider putting in those little bits of yellow. If I put those bits of yellow in right now, I'm gonna be fighting that bits of yellow for a long time. So I don't wanna do that just yet. I do wanna soften some of these colors, but what I think I'm gonna do is just kind of move around. I'm gonna be working on the entire sky at once kind of a thing. So I might get kind of quiet while I do that. If I if I get too quiet and you have questions, let me know. <laughs> but I'm just gonna be kind of playing with adding some cool colors. I will be adding things gently um, as I experiment through. And then sometimes, I like this color a lot. That might be in my foreground. Just gonna leave it there for a second. So we do have a lot of that soft transition on the edges. Um, and those transitions can get frustrating, right? So, Oh, that's way too white. Nope, 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 nope. So gentle touch is the key for sure. Ooh, I kind of like that. I think I went too far with the purple, so I'll have to bring that back. So this is a nice little gentle transition color. It sits nicely on top of things. Gentle, gentle drags get you your soft. The clouds that we're working with today, none of them have a really sharp edge to them. So this is where you may be tapping to get something to sit together. This little edge is kind of pretty. I'll have to zoom in later and show you. All right, so I don't have a lot of pigment down in this light blue area. Before I can really layer things in there, I wanna get some more down. Um, because when it's too little, then it causes its own set of problems. So this was a medium blue, but when I'm putting it on top of that lighter blue, it's giving me the value shift that I want. It's giving me that, the depth that I want. So when I just add in this little bit of turquoise, you can see how this is all color theory. This is how the colors play together. It's really light up here. It almost looks a little too light. And then down here though, now it looks a little too dark based on the colors that are next to it. It's the right color. I just have to make it the right color. I have to make it work properly. And I will, as I start to add value shifts in the oranges here. This is a little too much in the orange. I have to bring that back down a, a key or two.
So orange and pink together are always a nice color combo um, for your skies. Giving you that nice salmon-y color. I have a tendency now, you know, I want you guys to be, I want you to let your pastel do the work as much as you can. So for me, I'm adding a lot of color before I touch it. I probably will have to do a little bit of blending, but if I do too much in the beginning, then I'm gonna just have this pushed in, dull, gray looking thing happen. Nobody wants that, and that's pretty. This is where too, again, like that whole color theory thing happening, you can see, you know, orange and blue, they really love to play off one another and they start to make things kind of vibrate between the two. So without doing any kind of blending, I'm getting this texture and movement between the two colors. Um, so I'm going to be super careful before I blend any of that because I don't want to smash the life out of it, you know? Ooh, that yellow has green in it. Yeah, not what I wanted. So this yellow isn't necessarily correct in this location, but the orange by itself isn't going to work either. So I can use that pale yellow as part of my building blocks here. And then when I put the little bit of light orange on top, it magically becomes the right thing. And these shifts, you know, sunrise and sunsets, this, this subtle shift in color and intensity. You think you know the color that you're looking at, and then you look again and you realize, nope, it's a completely different color. It shifted from orange to pink and you didn't even see it until you start to paint and you realize that wasn't what you wanted. But I have found over and over again that I almost never, unless I'm working in blues, I almost never find an exact color with one stick. It's almost always, like if you look at my hand right now, <laughs> I have all sorts of pinks and orange and peachy and yellow in my hand. I'm gonna step aside for a second. Remember to step back and see what you're building. All right. 
I'm pretty happy with where this is going. Um, I'm going to add a little more blue and then I'm going to do, I'm going to touch a little bit because you know me, I, I don't want too much texture in my sky. Um, but I need to get a little more pigment down. We'll put some of that blue in these clouds. That's always fun. It changes that purple into the perfect. Ooh, I like that. Let's see. Might have to use that again. <clears throat> this is one of those times when you start to look around and you don't want to mess it up. <laughs> like you like certain things. You know it has to get moved around a little bit, but it's almost a little scary that you don't want to mess it up at all. So it's fun too. I'm going to start in here. I'm using the whole side. I'll be using like the majority of the side of my pinky. And I'm just gently sweeping in the direction that I want the clouds to kind of move. And I have this little bit of a arch thing happening. We have the directional lines, but they're also kind of going like this diagonal. And I'm being so gentle because I, I want a little bit of color mixing, but I don't want to make a new color, right? So when we want to make a new color, we take the two colors and you push them in, you kind of make a little circular motion and you push them together and you make a new color. Um, here, I just want the colors to kind of play with one another. I don't want one color, I don't want to make a new color and I don't want one color to be the star over another color. So if I take the side of my pinky, I can keep it gentle and I don't lose one color for another. However, I have to be careful because I know I don't have a lot of pigment on there. So I don't want to lose the side of my pinky either. I think I am going to get out a little bit more pipe insulation because it's still pretty. Low on pigment, but the blue area. I just have a little gradation happening, so I don't need to. Be too gentle. This one color on camera, it really, that lighter blue really picks up the light. It really reflects the light. And then you can see the pattern of the paper. A couple of those blues do that. And it just takes more layers than I want it to, to make it what I want it to be. gone through a lot of pipe insulation today trying to be frugal with my stingy with my pastel sorry if the scratching noise is terrible for me I know some people hate that noise So because I have that yellow there with that blue, now I get the green that I needed. In that little section. Oh, I hate the way the blue looks on camera. 
It's not so bad in person. I have to work on that. So this big old cloud up here is really soft. I have a lot of color in it right now. Don't necessarily want to beat the life out of it, but it's not a really heavy cloud. It's kind of heavy, but it's not like an ominous heavy. It is reflecting some of that color from down below. But the further away, the less intense that color is. But I can still make it intense if I feel like it. Um, I am adding quite a bit of pink here. But it's like a rosy red pink. So this little cloud streak, this is one of those examples. This little cloud streak that starts to make its way up starts off starts off as reddish and then as it gets further away from the sun it turns into that grayish purple again. So at some point, you just start to make that subtle transition. And I'm just using a little bit of the edge of the pastel to start it. Obviously, that's not the end line. <laughs> that would be a little silly. Um, and over here, I'm going to just test this out with this a little bit of cloud that was happening over here. Again, it needs that combination of orange and pink and even a little bit of purple. Not a lot though. Just enough so I'm just kind of tapping this one on there just to leave a little bit of pigment, but not muddy things up too much. Now we have um, about 45 minutes left. I have a feeling we will not be finishing this <laughs> in one sitting. So in the end, I'll ask to think about it for now. If you want to finish this together next week before we start a new one, or if you want to finish it on your own. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head to what you want to do. So I just found a little more of a gray purple that I'll be using. I don't want the pigment to be as vibrant in certain spots, right? I just want it to be a little bit more subtle, like in this little area right here where it's just a nice soft puff of a wave, of a wave, of a cloud. 
<laughs> so this is one of those scenarios where you see a little bit of the markings and you want the marking to be a little softer. So I'll be addressing that. But it's also, I'm not done adding pigment to that because it's a little flat and I kind of want a little bit more intensity before I start changing it. So this is a gentle tap because I don't want to make a big mark with something so dark. But it's certainly a good color to add up here too. And it'll be a good one down here. The little tufts of shadow. It's a good one for that. So I do still have like a lot of, I keep making a lot of marks before I touch them. So keep that in mind. It just, your instinct might be to mark and touch and mark and touch and mark and touch. Um, we just kind of have to keep building a little bit before you touch again. Okay. okay. Okay, so some of these edges here. I'm going to start with a little bit of a, I'm using my ring finger, just kind of gently touching the edges with a little bit of a sweep in it. Nothing, I don't want to blend, so I'll clean my finger often so I'm not dragging too much around, but I'm just kind of softening it up, setting it in place. And you know, just kind of pretend that your fingertip is a cotton ball kind of a thing, where you're just kind of gently puffing it onto the surface, not blending, not moving, just gently setting it in. Um, that's one of the ways to kind of get into that softness. So I kind of like that there. This is a little dark one. But Kind of makes a nice little subtle change. So definitely keep your finger clean and dry. So you have to do that. Take your time to do that. Um, so up here, it's a pretty hefty value shift. So I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive on that one um, and taking some of that blue from around it to soften it out. So I just was touching the edges just to kind of pull it around. I can always add more blue up against it if it got too out of hand. But clouds are something that they just take time. They take patience. They take a lot of standing back. Again, still using my ring finger. I don't want to go, or pinky, don't want to go crazy. You can always take a, a stiff bristled paintbrush too. That's still really bright. And break up. That's better. You can break it up or you can carve out a new sky hole. Right now, I don't have a lot of pigment down. So if I said, 
you know what? I want there to be more sky coming in through here. I can just take my pastel and just kind of carve it in with the pastel. If it was a really thick and heavy cloud, I could come back with my paintbrush and carve a path for it. Um, that's what I do if I'm trying to add a tree after the fact up into the sky, carve a little pathway, get myself some clean tooth out of it. Um, another thing, you know, we get to, sometimes those clouds have a nice big sweeping motion. And you want more of a sweep than a blend. So again, take your stiff bristle paintbrush. This one's on an angle, but it's open. It's stiff, but it's open, right? So I can grab, do this one in here. I can grab and just gently pull. And if I want more intensity, and then I can pull a little, be a little harsher, pull a little stronger. And now I have a gentle pull along with it. So here I haven't really touched the pigment that I put down. So this I'd already blended. This I haven't yet. So you can just experiment. So I'm going to set my paintbrush down and pull from the edge down. It softens the pigment that I put. And I can tap as I get a little closer. Now remember the paintbrush does take away. So that can work for you or against you depending on what you're doing. So in this situation, it was nice. It just kind of gently pulled some of that away. I didn't necessarily need it to be, it reads as a line, that little line of cloud. It reads as a line, but it's not a line. So I don't want it to be a line. Making my pinky again. So that has some purple in it here. Uh, kind of has some rose too. Ooh, that's a little bright. My finger was not clean. All right, before I get too far away from all of this, um, now I can kind of think about that little yellow streak that I was talking about before that comes into the middle of this. I think now I can kind of add that. <laughs> so of course my cloud is an exact it is not an exact drawing replica so some of this it's okay. Some of it's just a little bit different, but that's all right. So again, I'm just rotating that combination of the pinks to the peaches to the oranges and the yellows and it all makes those lovely little variety all right so in some spots that yellow is not intense enough it's not bright enough um 
So I'm going to use a little bit, just a little dab of that little lemon yellow. And then a little bit of that white. So that works together. <clears throat> okay, let me see here. Go back to that yellow. It's going to be a nice little yellow and peachy thing happening over here. So I'm getting a layer down of yellow first because I don't want the yellow to be on top. I want the kind of peachy subtle color to be on top. Everything's really super intense right now on my color scale here. Um, and I want to soften it just a little bit. Um, I want to soften some of it just to make those puppy clouds a little more subtle. Like they don't need to be so in your face. Oh, I kind of see there's a little bit of a pale, pale, pale pink. Let's see. Now, this is a Jack Richardson. And as I said, sometimes the Jack Richardsons work best when they are the star of the show of On the Tooth. But sometimes they work well in these situations where you want it just to kind of blend with what's there. So this is what it's doing for me, which is nice. It's leaving a bit of pigment with what's there, which is kind of what I need to happen. Um, it is a little dull though. Right. I'm going to keep just gently working with what's there. I might have to pull some of this away. So now that I have a lot of colors sitting on top of the blue, right? I have a lot of this kind of wispy feel of a cloud, but it's sitting on top of the blue. Um, so again, I have this open paintbrush and I can just gently dab just to pull some away. So it's the same kind of thing if we're working on a wave and we're making air holes in the foam, just kind of dabbing. I kind of like that. It's a little less intense. And then if I want those edges to be soft again, then I can tap them, tap it back down. If it got a little too, too much there.
But that's what I love about, you know, using the paintbrush to kind of tap some away because it doesn't completely negate the work you did. It leaves some of that color, but it really enhances what you've already done. I think a lot of what, you know, when I'm working with all these crazy colors reflecting in the clouds, you know, you'll hear me tap the pastel. I'm just tapping the paper just to lay a little bit of pigment down because I don't 